Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ben Shryock. I'm a CS50TF and I'm here to teach you today a little bit about CSS. Um, the title of my presentation is Make an Attractive Website with CSS, so hopefully I will teach you all how to make an attractive website with CSS. That's going to take about, uh, I've sort of broken it into five steps, the first being what is CSS, how do we use it, why is it so powerful. Uh, next, CSS syntax, which you'll see is very simple. Uh, then we'll sort of create this dichotomy between CSS properties for layout and CSS properties for appearance. Layout simply meaning the things that, that determine how elements are displayed in relation to each other on the page, and appearance being sort of the specifics of let's make this font color blue, or let's make it a font with a size of 16 pixels, things of that nature. And then most of the time we're going to spend actually styling, creating CSS uh, for CS50.net. So let's begin. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And what it does is simply styles the appearance of HTML elements on the page. Um, an HTML element can be anything from a paragraph tag to a div to a header, things of that nature. And it's powerful in part because it allows you to factor out sort of all the style from the HTML code. So we can even have multiple HTML pa uh, pages which link to the same CSS file. So one CSS file includes all our CSS code and it can dictate how an entire website looks. Um, where does the cascading part come in? Style sheets sort of make sense, but cascading means we start with the general and then we move to more specific. So if we have, for instance, like four paragraphs of text, each contained in its own P tag, paragraph tag, um, instead of saying each paragraph and like individually setting it to maybe have a font color of blue, such as by giving it a class and saying class of paragraph one blue, class of paragraph two blue, three blue, four blue, we can just say paragraph should have a color of blue, and then that will change everything on the page. And that way, we can start general. If we need to make a general change, we can do it in just one place as opposed to multiple places. And then if we decide, you know, I actually do want my second paragraph to be read, that's when we can maybe give that a class of paragraph two and set that one specifically to be read. So start general, move to more specific. Here is how we actually connect CSS to our uh, or HTML to the CSS we've written. And that is typically done either with external style sheets, internal style sheets, or inline styles. I'm going to talk mostly about external style sheets because that's what we want to use. Um, and so we see that somewhere just in the head of our HTML, uh, we include a link tag with a rel of style sheet, a type of text slash CSS, and then an href or a link to the path, a, containing the path to our CSS file. So in this case, we're assuming that my CSS file.css is in the same directory as this HTML page, and then anything we include in that page will now be included in this HTML file. Um, this is different than I think what you've seen a lot in lectures, where David will just sort of whip up a style using what's called an inline style, which as we see, we have like a paragraph tag and then specify the style right in line. Now this is bad for a couple reasons. One is it's very specific. So if we formatted all our paragraphs in this way, then, like I said earlier, we would have to go through and change each one individually. That would be quite the headache. Um, and also, it sort of breaks the abstraction barrier, if you will. We have HTML co-mingling with CSS, where if we use an external style sheet, we can separate our HTML from our CSS and make both things much more readable. Any questions so far? All right, do interrupt me at any point uh, if, you, if anything is unclear. So let's move on to CSS syntax. And in bold at the top is sort of the general case. We have a selector followed by an open curly brace and then a closed curly brace at the end. And inside of those curly braces, we have a series of properties and values, properties and values, as many as we want separated by semicolons. And that is all of CSS syntax. A few examples of what selectors can be. This first line, this first bullet, we see H2, and then we specify a color and a font size. And what this will do is grab any H2 element on the page um, and set its font color to white and its font size to 14 pixels. However, there are a couple other ways, uh, common ways, which we use selectors. Um, for example, if we want to select maybe some paragraph or not all paragraphs, not all H2s, or maybe in this case a right sidebar, we can give that div or that element uh, an ID, in this case ID of right sidebar, and we can access that element in our CSS by using this pound or hash tag symbol. So pound right sidebar says, give me the element with an ID of right sidebar and set its width to be 100 pixels. Um, similar to IDs, but importantly different, is 
classes. And we access classes with the dot or the period. So this says, give, uh, dot nav button says, give me all of the elements with a class of nav button and set their background color to be blue. Has David talked at all about the difference between ID and class in lecture? All right. So an ID is used on just a single element in a page, something that you're not going to have anything else. Like we have one right sidebar, so we give it an ID of right sidebar, as opposed to nav buttons, which if you picture like navigation buttons at the top of a page, we might have one with a link to home and another one with a link to contact us and maybe three or four or five, which we want to style all in the same way. So in our HTML, we say some div with a class of nav button. And then we can style everything with a class of nav button to have this property of background color blue. Any questions about this difference between ID and class? All right. We also have this phenomenon known as pseudo classes, which are not quite classes in themselves, but they are a very powerful tool. And the difference you might see here is we have sort of an A colon hover. And the hover is the pseudo class. A is an anchor tag, which we commonly see as a link. You will see something like A href equals www.facebook.com, and that will provide a link to Facebook. And here, can anyone guess what the A colon hover does? Well, that's OK. It changes the appearance when we hover over that element. So if we hover over the link to Facebook.com, we can do whatever is in the curly braces. In this case, text decoration none, as we'll see, will get rid of the underline. We could also make it bold. We could make it bigger. We could change the color. And so in this way, pseudo classes are very powerful because they can allow uh, us to make our website interactive without even using JavaScript or anything complex. And we also see comments. Uh, the way you comment in CSS is much like the multi-line comment in C. In fact, it's identical. Uh, we start with a slash star and end with a star slash. So moving on to sort of the two types of CSS, the first being CSS for appearance. Um, here I have listed just a bunch of possible property and value combinations. And each one I want to point out something sort of important about it. But as you might notice, it's sort of easy to intuitively understand what a CSS property is doing. For instance, font size 14 pixels. I'm pretty sure everyone can guess that this is changing the font size to 14 pixels. Um, but so instead of explaining what each of these things does, I'm just going to point out a couple important things. For instance, the first two show different ways of specifying color. Uh, background color, we give it a hex value. Color, we're using RGBA and then some parentheses. We've also seen we can specify for the more common color something just like red or blue or white, physically the word. Um, the hex value gives us just a little more control over the appearance, because as we saw in PSET 4 uh, forensics, uh, we can actually access the red, green, and blue individually and really have a lot of control over how the color appears on the page. Now this RGB, if there was not an A, is essentially similar to or the same as the hex. It specifies the amount of red, green, and blue. This RGBA, however, specifies the amount of transparency. That's what the A is. So you see we have 25500 0, 0, 0.5. And the 0.5 specifies the amount of transparency. I believe 1 would be opaque, 0 would be almost completely transparent. And you can think of some ways that this might be powerful. You can make a background image or a background color that's mostly transparent. And you can design your site in a very cool way using this uh, property. Font size, as well as other size, are usually expressed in pixels. In this case, a font size of 14 pixels. You'll also see width of an element, margins, padding, usually expressed in pixels, although you can express them in percentages. You can express them in EMs, uh, which I won't go into today, but just know that there are those other options. Font family is pretty intuitive, but you might wonder why we use a font family instead of just a font. Because when we're, when we're writing an essay in Microsoft Word, we say font is Comic Sans, and we don't specify other fonts. Um, but Microsoft Word, we know it's going to understand Comic Sans. When we are designing for the web page for a website and using CSS, there's no guarantee that the browser that someone is using will support the font that we are saying to use. So in this case, if maybe one of your parents hasn't bought a computer since the 1980s and is using Internet Explorer 3 and it doesn't have Helvetica New, then it says, all right, if you don't have this first font, go on to the second one. Try Helvetica. If Helvetica isn't available, sans serif. If that is not al also not available, use Arial. So in this way, we ensure that we at least have some control over the font that's being displayed. Even if we would prefer Helvetica to Arial, we at least know that it's not going to display as some gross other font that the web browser chooses for us. 
font weight will see pop up again and again. You can just make text bold, regular, thin. Um, text decoration determines decoration around a text such as underline or strike through. And then you'll also see occur commonly this text decoration none. Can anyone think of when something might be styled and we might just want to remove the text decoration from that? Well, the answer is when a, a lot of times you'll see this because links are by default underlined. So if you think of web pages you've seen, usually an unclicked link is blue and underlined, and once you click it, it's purple and underlined. But a lot of times we don't want our website to look like that. So you see text decoration none, we'll just get rid of that underline. And we can also change the color with a color tag. Now border, we'll see a pop up as we design uh, CS50.net. And that takes three values, the first being the thickness, the second being sort of the style, either solid, dashed, or somewhere in between and the final one being the color. So this border would say, give me a black border, make it solid, and make it have a thickness of two pixels. Moving on to layout, which we won't spend as much time on, but is very, very important. Um, starting simply, we sort of have a text align center. That's a simple way of setting the text inside of any element to be centered. Um, vertical align middle is a little more difficult to use, but you can sort of also have an intuitive understanding that it vertically align something to the middle of its parent element. Um, padding versus margin is important. Both change uh, the amount of spacing between elements. But um, there is an important difference that you should understand. If you think of a div, everyone picture just sort of a block with maybe a border around the outside and some text in the middle. And then maybe we have two similar divs with a border and some text in the middle, border, some text in the middle. What padding does is affect the amount of room between the outer edge or the border and the text. So if you increase the padding, then sort of the box expands. If you increase the margins, the box doesn't change, but the amount of space between the boxes change. In, in other words, the space between the divs will increase with margin. Do we have any questions on margin versus padding? It might help if I draw a picture, so I'm going to switch over to our fun iPad and draw it, give it my best shot. So if we have sort of two boxes, these are our two divs on the page, and inside is some text. Here we have hi, here we have hello. The space between them is the margin, and the space sort of right here, this would be the padding top. This would be the padding bottom. So it's inside the div, so for instance, if our border is way too close to our text, we would increase the padding so that there's more room between the text and the border. If our two divs, if these borders right here are too close together, we could increase the margin to expand that. Any questions? Does that help clear it up a little bit? All right, let's switch back to our laptop. Um, all right. And so you see there's sort of two, well, there are many ways of displaying padding and margin. In this case, padding 10 pixels says, create the padding top, right, bottom, and left to all be 10 pixels. This element should just have 10 pixels of padding all the way around it. You can also specify if you feel like the top should be different, the amount of padding or margin on top or bottom should be different, then you can specify up to all four. So this margin 10 pixels, 15 pixels, 20 pixels, 15 pixels specifies the top and then the right and then the bottom and the left. There's a helpful acronym called TROUBLE because it's top, right, bottom, left, TRBL. Um, and that allows you to have even more control over differing amounts of space from the top to the right to the left. And then we also see another common occurrence as we're laying out pages, which is this margin left auto, margin right auto. And what that does is it's similar to sort of the text align center. It's going to horizontally align something to the center of the page. But when we want to align, for instance, a div and not just some text, we need to use this margin left auto, margin right auto. And what that will do is sort of have the computer uh, automatically figure out, all right, let's make the left and the right approximately equal, the amount of margin, and then that will center the div on the page. These last two uh, properties are incredibly important. As you're laying out your page, you will use display, float, width very frequently. Um, so display determines essentially whether or not other items can be displayed next to this element. So if we have two divs again, like in my drawing, for them to display side by side, they would need to have a display of either inline or inline block. If their display was simply block, which is the default for divs, then they would display one over the other. You cannot have 
a display of block. A display of block simply says, do not allow other elements to be to my side. And then float is almost the reason, or at least one of the reasons, that CSS is so much better than uh, using an HTML table, for instance, to lay out your page. Because float is very dy dynamic. It says, take this element that I'm saying float left and move it as far to the left as you can. And so if you have other elements, you can say, all right, float this one left as well. And then they'll display as far to the left as they can, side by side. And this can be better because as you sort of resize your browser window or do any number of things, it ensures that the, the layout is fluid and dynamic. Um, do we have any questions so far before we sort of dive into the heart of this presentation? All right. So CS50.net. I have provided for you the HTML pu pulled directly from the website, same HTML that actually displays the page. But like David does in many of your problem sets, I forgot to include something that was really, really important for what we're trying to do. And that was CSS in this case. Um, so you'll see we have the HTML for the entire page in a file called unstyled.html. Um, and it's unstyled because it currently doesn't link to any CSS page. But when we look at that and when we look at the actual HTML form of this page, you'll see it's a lot of HTML. And I know we're just sort of getting comfortable with that. So I've also broken it into smaller pieces, in, in, uh, such as header, content, left nav, right nav, and footer. So we'll see sort of a pattern of there's a header.html, which links to a header.css, and a content.html, which links to a content.css. And what we're going to do, because I accidentally left all these CSS files blank, is write the CSS to style each section of the page individually, and then at the end, we will sort of include all the CSS that we wrote into unstyled.css, and which will link to unstyled.html. And that will sort of format all of the elements on the CS50.net homepage. However, at that point, we're sort of going to switch from CSS for appearance to CSS for layout. We're going to have a bunch of really pr a pretty header and a pretty left navigation bar and a pretty right navigation bar. But as we go through it, we're not going to write CSS for layout. So it's going to look atrocious because we'll have these pretty elements, but they will be overlapping and gross. And when we resize the browser, they will go all on top of each other, and it will be terrible. So at the end, we're going to sort of write the CSS for layout, which makes the page look good and gives us our final project or product. So that is the end of our slides. So let's dive in. Let's start by looking at this is CS50.net. Not as glorious as it appears on the actual interwebs. Um, so we sort of see at the very top left corner, we have this is CS50, but much smaller and uh, not as beautiful as it usually is. And so we see our left nav bar over here is sort of uh, right above our right nav bar instead of sort of being you know, to the left of it. So we're going to go ahead and try to, make, uh, try to improve these problems. And if we look at unstyled.html, again, you don't need to sort of dive into this because it is a lot of HTML and I've broken it up for you. So let's start with the header, which if we look at header.html, I may have accidentally implemented this one. But thankfully, now it looks terrible again. So this is CS50. Um, let's make this look good again. So we'll dive in first to header.html. Can everyone see this OK? All right. So you see that the HTML here is much more simple. We simply have a link to header.css, and then we have a header class with a, the class name being site header. And inside of that, we have this link with a class of logo. And I'm a little narcissistic, so I linked it to my own web page because I'm giving the presentation. And then we see a little bit of text. This is CS50. So let's style this. Um, so here's our blank header.css. And we're going to want to select maybe the outer div or the outer header based on its class. Um, and so if you'll remember, that was dot site header. Um, and so we open our curly braces and close our curly braces. And then we can simply add whatever properties we so choose. In this case, I think the first thing we should do is instead of having this header left aligned, let's move it to the center. So for that, we can use this text align property. We'll simply say text align center as we saw on the slides. We will flip back to the web page, and voila, it is centered. So if this is not dynamic enough for you, though, like we change one thing in the file, and then we can see how it looks on the page, we also have a very powerful tool called inspect element, or firebug 
is a similar thing in Firefox, which I think David has shown you in lecture. But what it allows us to do is inspect element. We pull up sort of the HTML for the page. Um, so right here, we can see that same HTML that was just in our file with a head, a body. Inside this header, we have a class of logo. Looks the same. And then if we scroll over to the right, we see the CSS that is being applied here. And so what we can do is dynamically change how it looks on the page, simply by double clicking, typing in right, spelling it correctly, hitting enter. And then if I zoom back out, you'll see that it is now on the right. By default, it is text aligned left. So if I remove this, now it's on to the left. So for things where you're not quite sure how you want it to look, like you want maybe a color to be a certain shade of gray, and you're not sure what shade yet, you can sort of say, all right, make this gray, and then you can play with it and see immediately how it looks in the browser. Or if you think, I want this element to be about 200 pixels of width, um, but maybe it's actually 225. And you can just play around with that and not have to constantly switch back between uh, your files and the browser. So in other words, inspect element is your best friend as you do CSS. Um, but since an important thing to point out is that those changes do not stick around. So if you change something sort of just in the browser using inspect element, you will later want to add those changes to your CSS. Because if I refresh the page, it will pull back. It will not save those changes. It will pull from the file. So as you see, we say text align center. And that's what happens when I refresh. Um, so inside this header.html, now we need to sort of style this link. Can anyone think of ways that we, should, we could make this look more like the actual website? Any properties, any, even without the property name, should I change the color? Should I change size? Bot family? Yeah. Can you remove the text exactly. Remove the text decoration. So right now it has that unattractive link uh, or underline because it's by default a link. So I'm going to access the logo class inside of the site header class. So this is another, a very good way of using CSS selectors. And what this does uh, is go to any element with a class of site header. Go inside that element and find an element with the class of logo, and then style logo. So this is, will, in effect, do the same thing as just dot logo, because we only have one class of logo. But if we ever wanted to use the class of logo elsewhere in our page and wanted to style it differently, then we can say, all right, only do this for the logos which are inside site header. Any questions about that? All right, so we can see how we can make very specific changes to our site using CSS. So as we heard from our friendly audience member, we'll set the text decoration to none. Um, and when we switch back, if I didn't make any typos, we'll see the underline disappear. So one thing at a time, we are making this beautiful. Um, other things we might want to change uh, include maybe the color. I'm going to, this is something you could play around with in Inspect Element, but because I have prepared for this presentation, I know that I want it to be this nice gray. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change two more things before we look back at the actual appearance. That's going to be a font size. Again, you could play around, but I'll just set it to 110 pixels. And then the font weight, we're going to make this bold. So now when we go back to our uh, lovely file and refresh, this is CS50. And it's close. But I personally like the font that we use on the web page. Uh, so I'm going to change the font family, give it a little bit of uh, room. I'm just going to specify Helvetica new, and then Helvetica and then Arial for a couple fallbacks. Now we refresh, and that looks like a nice header. Any questions so far? All right, that was a nice easy one. Let's move on to something that looks even worse and that we will make look even better, and that is content. So you may have seen this on the top of CS50.net. It usually has a pretty yellow background and nice text. The links are well formatted. We don't see weird dots on the side. And uh, right now, we see all of those things. So let's take a look at, first, the HTML in content.html. Um, and we see it's a little more complicated, but really, it's not too bad. We have a link to content.css. We have a class, which we could call content. In this case, it's called Facebook Notification, because that's what it's called on the website, and I didn't want to change it. 
And then we see an unordered list. And inside each of these list elements, it's not really important what's in there, but we have some text, we have a few links, text, links, and uh, four list elements in total. So this will be a little more involved. Let's start writing the CSS. Make our font size bigger. Um, can anyone think of maybe a change we should make to start it all off? Background color. Background color. Perfect. Um, so we have this div, or we have this, yes, div with a class of Facebook notification. So we will grab based on the class and set Facebook notification um, to have a property of background color. And then I'm going to pick this beautiful yellow that we use, which is hex FCF 8E3. Um, and then if we open our page back up, we see indeed that there is a background color. Although it doesn't look as nice without the text being a different color and without a border. So let's add those things. Let's start by saying the text or the color of any text inside this should be C09853. And again, I'm sorry for pulling these numbers out of thin air, but it's something you can play with as you design your site. And you can look up color schemes. There are many great resources online to find colors that look good together and to find the hex values for very specific colors. And then let's also go ahead and give it this border, which, as we saw in my slides, requires three things. First, a size, a thickness, and then a style, and then a uh, color. And we will give it fbead5, which apparently is a thing. And if we refresh, that's starting to look better. We have a pretty yellow, nice border. But there's more we can do. Um, one thing, we'll do a little bit with appearance. I think we could use a little more space and a little better formatting. So let's add some padding. And we'll do it as we saw the margins in our uh, presentation. We're going to specify the top value, the right value, the left value, and the bottom value. Not in that order, though. So top, right, bottom, and left. And so now, hopefully, you'll be able to see sort of what I was talking about earlier. When we refresh, there's more space inside the box. Yeah, question? Um, what changed the font color? Because I don't see that. Like, you styled the font color, and it went from black to Sure. That's a good question. That's one place where CSS isn't intuitive. Color refers to font color. So I guess the makers of CSS decided that uh, it would be easier to type color than font color. That would be the thing we needed to change the most. So color means font color. Good question. Um, so now we have our padding. We have this starting to look better. Uh, let's change one more thing right here, which is actually, let's change two things. Let's first just change the font size to make it a little bigger. We'll set it to 13 pixels. And then the last thing is we have sort of this square border. If we zoom in to an edge, which I may or may not be able to do successfully, we see it's rectangular. And I personally like rounded edges. They're in style right now. And the way we can do that is with a new tag or a new property that we haven't seen yet. And that is called border radius. And essentially, border radius does what you would think. A radius refers to a circle. So the, more, the bigger this value is, the more circular it's going to be. So if we just display something like four pixels, then we'll just see a nice little rounded edge on the corner. It's a little difficult to see, but Take my word for it. Th little things like this make a big difference. Um, and here is a good point to talk about, again, sort of ensuring that your CSS is compatible with all browsers. So for the first time, I'm going to show you what are called uh, vendor prefixes. And for the border radius property, not all browsers support it in the same way. Uh, so what we can do is specify things like for the WebKit border radius, uh, let's also set it to four pixels. WebKit is Mozilla Firefox and Google Chrome. And then we can also, or, I'm sorry, it is Safari and Google Chrome. And then Mo's border radius is four pixels as well. So this will ensure that our uh, CSS, that our web page is displayed in the way we intend it across multiple browsers. Um, so even though when I refresh the page, this probably won't 
change anything? It could if I was using a different browser. Question? What about uh, in Explorer? I am not sure what the prefix for, if there's a prefix for inter Internet Explorer. It could be included in WebKit. It could be covered by the default case. Um, I can look that up after the presentation if you'd like. Um, all right, so we're getting closer. But I would say the main thing we haven't styled yet is the links. Does anyone know what tag we can use to access the links? So that would be the A tag. And in this case, we're going to use Facebook notification A to specifically say, get only the anchor tags that are inside the div of Facebook notification. And so as someone pointed out earlier, again, we'll want to get rid of the text decoration, get rid of the underline. Um, and then we should maybe make them bold and change the color. So we'll do those two things now. Any questions here? That should make our links look good. It's starting to look like what we have on the web page. And finally, though, let's utilize a pseudo class. Because right now we sort of mouse over these links and nothing happens. I guess the cursor changes to a, mouse, uh, to a clicker, pointer, mouse guy. But I would like to maybe actually re-underline the links when we're highlighting over them so people really know when they're about to click on a link. And the way we can do that is by accessing inside of the Facebook notification, uh, inside an element with that class. We can use a pseudo class. We can use the hover pseudo class that we talked about earlier. And then we can simply set the text decoration to be underlined. So we refresh. And now we should see no change until we mouse over a link. And then we see the underline. Mouse off, mouse on. Any questions about pseudo classes? All right. We are going to move on now to style the left and right navigation bars. This is more involved. Should it start to take too long, we might uh, stop. You'll have to trust me that by applying these same principles, we could do it. Um, without too much difficulty, and we'll move on to the CSS for layout and creating the final product, because I don't want to uh, run out of time and not get to talk about that. So let's look at leftnav.html. If we refresh, we see another gross list with the default buttons, which are fine, um, but unstyled links and things of that nature. So let's go and look at what leftnav looks like in the HTML. I'm going to make this bigger for you. Wow, I really changed all these links. <laughs> My website doesn't even really have anything there. Uh, but so we see, again, a little more. We link to a file called nav.css. Uh, and this is the one place where this example is different from the ex other examples. We link both left nav and right nav to the same CSS file because they're so similar. And because we can style both of them using one sheet, and we don't have to duplicate styles. Um, so that's sort of the first example of how CSS can be used to style multiple things from one page. But essentially, we have sort of the stuff about David. We have another unordered list with uh, FAQs and Q evaluations, and then a large unordered list with the final projects and the lectures and all the important things of that nature. So we're probably going to want to style this class of lecturer. We're going to want to style the unordered list, the list elements themselves, uh, in both of these cases. So let's hop on over to nav.css. Well, let's first look at right nav. Uh, it's very similar. We see a class instead of the one about David. We have a class called other links, which looks at CS50 TV and the CS50 store. And then we see links to sort of some of the cool uh, discuss gradebook submit run tools that we have. Sorry about that. Um, so we can see they're very similar structures. We're probably going to want to display them in a similar manner. If we pull up CS50.net, we will see that, indeed, this looks a lot like that, right? Um, sort of similar stylings. Maybe the one on the left is right aligned. The one on the right is left aligned. Uh, but we can make this look good from one style sheet. So let's open up that style sheet. And that is nav.css. So can anyone think of properties that we want to apply to both of these, uh, both the left and the right nav bar? Could be anything. Right now, it doesn't have the font we want. Um, it doesn't have, for instance, the maybe list style. It currently has those bullet points, and we want to get rid of those. So let's dive in by saying something like, sorry about the small size. Let's increase that. 
we'll set the resources navbar, which is the name of the uh, class for the left sidebar, and the events navbar, which is the name of the right sidebar. Um, and we're going to take, I made a mistake here. This would not style the right sidebar because I forgot a dot. So that would have been looking for the events navbar element, just like an h2 or a paragraph element, and it would not have found one. Um, CSS typos. So we're going to just, for now, specify the font family. Um, and you might see, since I've split this up into like five different CSS files or four, we're sort of repeating some things, like font family again and again. That's why we, in general, use one CSS page or two, because then we can just say, all right, everyone link to this page that says font family is Helvetica. Um, and then we don't have to repeat it again and again. And I'm just going to get even more simplified. Um, so that should go ahead and at least give us the correct font. Looks good. Um, let's style these unordered lists. I'm going to do what you are not quite supposed to do in copy paste, um, because we are going to, inside of each of these elements, access the unordered list. So this will access both the unordered list inside of the class elements with class resources navbar and events navbar. Um, I guess I forgot to mention this comma is a powerful way of accessing two classes uh, with the same, or applying the same properties to two classes or more. Any questions about this? All right. So what do we want this unordered list to have? Right now, the unordered list encompasses sort of all of this and all of this. And I think we should get rid of the dots. And this is a property you have not yet seen, but it's a simple one. It's called list style type, and we can give it a value of none. So list style type will take our list and remove the dots. It can also be used to maybe use squares or triangles if you want to create a fun list with fun shapes. Um, but in this case, we don't want fun shapes. And then let's go ahead and give it a margin of zero pixels. I'm going to add a little bit of CSS for layout. Uh, and just bear with me that it's important. I would encourage you to use the position uh, property as little as, well, I shouldn't say as little as possible. But when you use position, and you use either relative or absolute, in this case, we're going to absolutely position this on the page, which means no matter what, it will appear on the same place on the page. That can be dangerous, because you can have uh, a website that then maybe looks really good on your computer, which is a, of maybe an 11-inch screen. But if someone looks at on it on a desktop monitor, which is way bigger, then maybe your site only displays absolutely on these 11 square inches. And then there's a bunch of empty space over on the right side. Does that make sense, how that, something like that could happen? But here, we're just going to use position absolute. And then from there, we can specify things like the distance from the top of the parent element, the distance from the bottom of the parent element. And uh, we're also going to give this a width of 175 pixels so that we can correctly uh, move it about the page. So this may do that to left nav. And to right nav, we see similar thing. This is really going to be important, this position absolute, when we move the right sidebar to the right of the page. That's how we're going to do it in this case. If I were designing the site from scratch, I might use floats. Like, for instance, float the left sidebar to the left, then float content to the left, then float right sidebar to the left. But this is another way of doing it, which may or may not be better in this case. Um, so later on, we will set right to be something like 0 or 5 pixels, um, the property right. And that will move the right sidebar to be to the very right side of its parent element. Um, Let's go ahead on and style a few more things for both of them. The next being those links, because again, we have a few links in there. Um, forgive my copy pasting. I just don't want to uh, type it all up. So we are going to go inside the unordered list. Then we're going to go inside the list. And then we're going to go inside to the anchor tags that are inside those list elements. Do we have any questions about what that selector is doing? So you can see we sort of went from h2 to a very complex thing with resources, navbar, ul, li, a, comma, and all this again very quickly. But if you just think about what it's saying, it's still quite intuitive and makes a lot of sense. So let's see. What do we want to do with these links? Uh, right now, I sort of mouse over them. Nothing happens. They're underlined. I don't really like that. So let's again, let's change the color. 
2B777, another nice gray. Uh, we will set the text decoration to be none to get rid of that uh, underline. And let's increase the font size so it looks a little better, 16 pixels. And then there's also this other CSS property, which I had not run into until I saw the uh, CS50 page and started diving into some of this code. Um, but there's something called WebKit Font Smoothing. And you might be able to guess what this does. Uh, font Smoothing is sort of a made-up property <laughs> that determines how smooth a font looks. And there are a few different uh, properties you can give to this, which you will probably want to look up if you ever use them. Um, in this case, we're going to give it something called anti-aliased, which I am having trouble spelling. Anti-aliased. And we'll see, in addition to the decoration and color changes, it just sort of makes everything smoother or l less smooth. I can, if you are curious as to how anti-aliasing works, talk to me after the, picture, uh, after the lecture or seminar. Um, Let's also change the general list elements. Right now, you can see they're kind of smooshed together. Uh, let's give them a little padding. So we are again going to grab this and set the list elements inside of unordered list to have a set amount of padding. In this case, we'll say uh, four pixels and zero pixels. Now, this is a little different than the way we've seen padding or margin expressed, but I would encourage you to simply look it up because you can specify top right, bottom left. You can, express, you can specify something like this where the first number, I believe, refers to top and bottom and the second to right and left. Or you can even do it with three numbers, but I don't do that, so I don't remember which each num what each number refers to. So here we should see a yes. So we changed the top padding and the bottom padding. We did not change the right and left padding. So we're getting closer. If we look at net left nav, those are the changes we've added as well. Um, let us go ahead on now. We could go through this and change the appearance uh, in the same way that we have for everything else. I don't think there are any other uh, properties or values that you haven't seen already. We would simply want to maybe make things bold. We still need to uh, grab these links over here and these links over here and affect them. Uh, add some padding to sort of move it away from the very left side of the page. And uh, maybe the one thing I will do quickly, we'll see if I've made any mistakes, but just grabbing the events navbar, which is the right navbar, and setting its property of right to be five pixels. Unless I've forgotten another something, this should take right nav and move it to the right side. So that's how we get the right nav bar on the right and the left nav bar on the left. All the other appearance things we've seen already. So what we're going to do is move on to unstyled.html and unstyled.css. So what I've done with unstyled.html or with CSS is already added everything that I knew we were going to write today. So this includes all the appearance that we wrote, the appearance that we didn't quite have time to write, and uh, a couple extra things thrown in there that I uh, simplified as we were going through it but nothing complex. And so in this file, we see a lot of CSS. Uh, let me go ahead and zoom in. But then we also see sort of these three important things that we did not implement. Um, and here we're going to add some CSS for layout properties. Let me go ahead and increase the text size for us um, to 24. So as you can see, there's a lot of CSS in here. But most of that we wrote already. And then we see this content wrapper outer div, or uh, class, content wrapper inner class, and a main content class, which have no styling. And so if we pull up, this is again unstyled.html, and if we look at it in a browser, we don't see any of the formatting we made. And the reason for this is simply because I have not let yet linked to that style sheet. So if we zoom in right here, let's make this a font size of 24 pixels we see that I simply used HTML comments to comment out this link. So once I remove the left side of the comment and the right side of the comment, we will see unstyled.css be applied, and we'll see all the changes we made um, appear, but before there's any CSS for layout. So we refresh, and now you can kind of see what I was talking about. We have this beautiful content. We have a beautiful left and right nav bar and footer, but they're overlapping, and once I get out of full screen mode and sort of resize my browser, 
it gets even worse. I mean, this is sort of undefined behavior that we just don't want to have happen. So let's make things big again and take a look at first the HTML to see where these three divs are. Uh, main con so here's content wrapper outer. In fact, let's use inspect element to do this because that will, when we inspect element and highlight over something, it will display it on the page. So if you can see right here, I'm highlighting over content wrapper and or content wrapper outer, and everything is becoming blue because that surrounds all of the content. If we look at content wrapper inner, that is just sort of this main content thing. And then if we scroll over to this side and open up this div to see what's inside it, we see there's this div class or section class main content, which again is sort of that main content. And we are going to add styling to all of these three things to make our final product look good. So here, we are going to zoom back out, hop on over to unstyled.css, and take a look at our three to-dos. So let's start by looking at content wrapper outer. Now the thing about layout is it's sort of the one place where if you forget a property, it can affect other properties. For instance, if you again have these two divs that you're trying to put side by side, um, but the first div you set to be display inline block and you float it. If you set it to be display inline block and you set the one below it to be display inline block and you expect them to show up next to each other, there's a good chance that they won't. And that's because you forgot about the width property. And width is very important because without it, width is automatically inherited. In other words, the top div, the first div, will take up as much, as much space as is available. In other words, there's no room to the right for the bottom div. Once you specify a width of, say, 200 pixels for both of them, then they can display side by side. But CSS for layout, it takes a few properties sometimes to have an effect. Um, and that can sometimes be aggravating. Um, so let's just go ahead and take this content outer wrapper and set it. Um, what shall we do first? Let's, let's give it a property called max width, which, as you might guess, sets the maximum possible width to 1550 pixels. That is just sort of a useful thing for robustness um, in case it's displayed on a really big screen. We have a little control over what happens. You also see a property called min width, which we will not use here, but which I found very helpful for the resize problem. If you have a div all the way around everything in your page with a, with a set width and then you resize, that div won't change size. In other words, everything within it should remain the same because when you, when you resize, the div will still just, it will sort of cut off and you won't see what was on the right instead of everything jumping um, on top of each other and overlapping. So uh, let's go ahead and also add some margins of 20 pixels and auto. We'll add some padding, 10 pixels and zero pixels. Oh, actually, we do use this min width property. Um, so here we see a min width of 1,024 pixels. And let's see if that even fixes the problem that I was just talking about. So we see there's a little more spacing towards the top. Uh, page is starting to look a little bit better. If we resize, we see at least this is CS50 does not jump down. And that's because we've specified that min width. Um, I think the absolute positioning of the right element, uh, we haven't accounted for that yet, so it still overlaps a little bit. But you can see that that just one line made the page look a lot better as we resized. Um, so let's also add a border radius to sort of define um, the outer thing. I'm just, for sake of time, not going to add our cross-browser compatibility. Oh, great. Yeah, feel free to stick around. Uh, we just have these two last things to style, and then I'll take any questions that there might be. So I do expect that we'll be done within five minutes or so. Uh, sorry that we had to skip a little bit in the middle there. Um, but content wrapper inner. So again, if you remember, that is sort of this guy. And we can uh, affect him. We're just going to again use this position tag. We're going to set a position to relative. And that should, all right, it'll do that. So it positions it relative to these two guys on the side, the re le left and right 
sidebars, which we used position relative to. Um, so now that slid those down. So instead of them being in line with the header up here, they're going to be in line with the content, which is something we want. But we still want this main content to not overlap everything. Um, so let's make that change. And let's do it in main content. This is perhaps the most broadly applicable thing. We're going to set, uh, let's, let's give it a lot of padding to sort of uh, give it a fixed place on the page. 30 pixels, 40 pixels, 100 pixels, and 40 pixels. Um, we'll give it a margin, again, to sort of uh, statically put it on the page. It's possibly not the best way of laying it out, but it does work. So now you see, with that stat, uh, padding and margin, we have placed it right in the middle where we want it. Um, just to make it a little bit better looking, we're going to set the background color to be white. And we are going to set the minimum height to be 510 pixels, which is similar to the min width property, but for height. So now if we refresh, we see there's a min width for this content. Um, this big block here is what we just set to be white. And then to finally finish our project, I'm going to come out, out one more line, which was initially just sort of taking up space. And that is this iframe, which you'll see what the iframe does in a second. Um, but let me slowly scroll all the way over here. Get rid of this comment. This iframe simply contains the big board. And so now you can see we have gone from styling each element individually, each section of the page individually, to sort of styling the appearance, the layout overall. Um, and then here you have a somewhat static but quite beautiful look uh, version of CS50.net. So this is CSS to make an attractive website. This is CS50.net, and uh, thank you all for coming.